technical magazines were writing about how he'll free people from poverty. Because remember, in 1910, we had yes. energy poverty. And yeah, yeah. There were hopes and dreams kind of hinging on this. But then fast forward to October of 1910, and it turns out the guy was kidnapped. And the condition for kidnapping was to forego his solar patent and close the whole business. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Segenda, for uh, joining us in today's convo. Um, so I'm Derek. I'm Sophia. And, um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I'm a lecturer at the University of Oxford, and I do work on energy innovation. Um, a lot of my research focuses on how we can get to a net zero future. Right. So, um, and the reason I invited you here is uh, because, you know, we we were doing some, some research work, and uh, we usually follow closely the, uh, the work uh, by the conversation, and I stumbled on one of your articles. And which is really strange because living in Canada, I've never heard about this before. And I don't know, Sophia, if you have you heard about this before? So no. um, it, the thing read, read like a Dan Brown novel. I'm like, OK, what's going on here? <laughs> this is this is crazy. So uh, being in this field for all these years. So it's like and, you know, we get this from someone in the UK. So I'm like, OK, but let's step back for a second. And, you know, you say you were doing um, some research on the economics of clean energy innovation and you stumbled on this story. Uh, tell us about, first of all, about what you were doing that led you to this story. Sure. So it was late at night and I do a lot, lot of work with patent data to trace the history of energy innovation. So um, while I was tracing solar patent data, I actually saw this patent from 1906, um, mm -hmm. which was talking about solar technology. And that was really shocking um, because the story, the conventional story is that solar emerged during the 1950s or the mm. 1970s when NASA was working on space. But to see a solar patent going all the way back to 1906 was frankly very shocking. Yeah. And then of course we could see that it was a, a man named George Cove who had filed the patent. Wow. That is exciting. And it's even more, you know, eerie that you were stumbling on it during night work. <laughs> so yeah, right. for, for those who haven't read the article, can you tell us a little bit about George Cove's story? Sure. Um, so basically the night continues and I'm like, OK, who's this really interesting person from 1906 who was already working on solar? So um, there's some really nice uh, digital archives that, that you can go to. So I just simply typed in the name George Cove on the Internet. Um, and, so and we also saw, saw some pictures you shared. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And he turned out he was from Nova Scotia um, mm -hmm. and is a serial inventor. He actually has tons of patents ranging from funky electricity innovations to working on uh, electrical watches, even on mm. electrical pianos and, and the solar patents. So you're like, and even and it's funny. We, we know about Edison's and their wars and, and all that. And this guy is yeah. just there, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a genius, right? So mm -hmm. he has not one patent, but a series of super interesting innovations. So as I'm following his story, it turns out that he went to New York to demonstrate his solar panel because it really uh, interested a lot of investors. Yeah. And he basically went viral at the time. So newspapers in Australia were talking about his fantastic sunray machine. Technical magazines were writing about how he'll free people from poverty. Because remember, in 1910, we had yes. energy poverty. And yeah, yeah. There were hopes and dreams kind of hinging on this. But then fast forward to October of 1910, and it turns out the guy was kidnapped. And the condition for kidnapping was to forego his solar patent and close the whole business. So there was a clear, so there's a clear person or entity or industry we could be looking at for doing this because, and you know, but it's funny because I want to read something here because this is a, uh, um, in your article, you quote uh, Modern Electric Magazine. They say, um, you know, the article noted how cheap solar energy could liberate people from poverty, you know, uh, bringing cheap light, heat, 
and power and freeing the multitude from constant, you know, um, struggle for bread. I'm just reading here. But the piece went on to speculate how even airplanes could be powered by, you know, uh, sun charge. But I don't know where did the Wright brothers, they just invented, right? They were just uh, invented. But do you think this could have worked at the scale of which this article was quoting at that time? Well, it's interesting to think that certainly um, the idea of harnessing the sun, uh, as Elon Musk said, the sun is this fusion reactor that is just in our solar system spitting out energy, right? It's yeah. this source of inspiration, really. And it's like, well, why don't we harness that? Why can't we trap that into batteries? Why can't we put those batteries on aeroplanes? Why can't we use this resource that is just abundantly uh, there. Yeah. Um, and we need to remember at the time of the early 1900s or the late 1800s, all energy innovation was pretty early stage. So even though George Coast solar panels were the first version, right? They were in some senses rudimentary. Mm -hmm. We need to remember even oil itself was super rudimentary. The oil from the late 1800s is nothing like what we use today. People yeah. would actually regard it as dangerous and not refined enough. Um, so we need to remember that actually, even though it was rudimentary, the fact that it was there in New York, that he demonstrated in rooftops. And if you see the picture, yeah. the slanting and the visuals are very much like how we see rooftop so, solar. Today. today, yeah. Yeah, so for, some, for some people, his innovation would seem threatening, right? So let's dig a little bit deeper into the kidnapping. Um, do you believe that fossil fuel industry had a role to play in it? Did you find any evidence in your in your search? So just to be clear, we don't have like um, precise police reports or remember this is 1910, right? So we need to do some serious archival work to really yeah. get hardcore evidence. But there was a really interesting piece written um, by a scholar in New Brunswick that talked about the historical context of the time mm -hmm. where mm. Edison was deploying really ruthless business practices to squash competition. And in fact, we know Edison actually mm. um, discredited Nikola Tesla. Yeah. That is yes. The, yeah, we remember the, uh, the current war. There's actually a movie it, about it. Exactly, mm. exactly. So actually Edison took Nikola Tesla's alternating current and electrocuted horses, farm animals, and even a human to show that that was dangerous and they should use his current instead. Of course, oh, we know the alternating current is extremely useful, right? So, yeah. and by the same token, remember, J.D. Rockefeller is the reason we have antitrust regulation. I guess yeah, people mm. I read that. that. I was like, whoa. Yeah, I mean, he basically created the world's largest monopoly, bought out all competitors, drove them to the ground to the extent that the U.S. government introduced the Sherman Act to regulate against the cartels and the trusts that were favoring the rise of Standard Oil. Mm -hmm. So when we think of the way businesses conducted themselves, remember, this is the wild west of American capitalism. We don't even have antitrust law, mm -hmm. like, codified. We don't even have concepts like responsible business practice. This is sort of like anyone can do whatever they want. Anything. Right? Right. Yeah. I so, don't but even remember that. But but back to this because well yeah we we can say fossil fuels there's a clear demon or there's a clear enemy to target but this guy we don't know much about him as a person right but did he like did he have personal issues did you find any evidence of did he have personal issues did you find more about him like even a biography autobiography about mm -hmm. him. Did he have issues? I mean, he built a uh, what fifteen million dollar company at that time, which with today's money is like what one hundred and fifty million, I think, by yeah. the the article um, that in valuation. And like, did he borrow money from shady people? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, this is New York in the nineteen hundreds, right? <laughs> well, look. So basically, there there is more to the story. Um, this guy, we know he was a serial inventor. Um, we actually know that some of his siblings passed away because remember at that time, modern medicine wasn't as prevalent. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And we know he lived close to the Bay of Fundy, which is where one of the strongest waves in the world actually mm. exists. So awesome. imagine a boy who sees the force of nature. He's at the Bay of Fundy and he's like, can we harness that? Um, this is the time Nova Scotia was just getting connected from the railroads. So it's yeah. a time where one can dream, one can hope. One looks at the power of nature. One looks at the tides. One looks at the sun. And this is a man who had patents for these technologies, jumps on the railroad and starts doing demonstrations. And oh. he gets popular. People see, oh, this is a man who actually has something to say. Yeah. Actually, the Canadian government even gave him an award for one of his inventions. Okay, And his father was lauded as a mechanical genius by an Australian newspaper that was talking about George Cove. The plot so, thickens. The plot thickens. He but why have we never learned about George yeah, Cove? Like... <laughs> yeah, well, history is written by the winners. Remember that. Well, okay? that's true. And we, we now have stamps from some weird Canadian actors I've never heard of and I've never watched <laughs> anything they've done. But this guy has just been, you know... Now, so back to your article for a second here. You, you talk about the lost, um, the four lost decades and you cite, you know, something, uh, rights law. I just want to let you, you know, tell us about that. Tell us a little bit about rights law and how you, you wonder what you were trying to do with it. Okay. So rights law is the simple idea that the more we build of something, the better we become at it. It's pretty, it's just as simple as that. Um, and in fact, for solar energy, we found that with every doubling of production, solar becomes 20% cheaper. And that wow. trend has been observed since the 1970s to the present day. So um, this is why today solar is actually the cheapest form of electricity in the world. So the thought experiment is simple. It's like, well, what if solar started in 1910 instead of the 1950s? Yeah. What if we had 40 more years of iterating on solar? So it's not saying George Cove's solar is perfect. It's just saying, what if the race started yeah. in 1910? Back then, early. Exactly. Then how much cheaper could solar have become? And, and you know, how would this race between fossil fuels and renewables, how would it have played out in this counterfactual world? And what I find under a set of assumptions, which, um, you know, you can play around with, is that under the most conservative scenario, um, solar would have become cheaper than coal at the oh. turn of the millennium when the Spice Girls were popular. But if, <laughs> but if, you change those assumptions, it could have become cheaper even in 1993. Um, so it really depends on what you input. The base case I say is, remember when the Spice Girls were popular? Mm -hmm. What if solar was already the cheapest technology then? And the reason this matters is because the technology we deploy is the cheapest, right? Yeah. We want yeah. energy to be as affordable as possible. As possible, yeah. And when the Spice Girls were popular till the present day, we saw a huge expansion of fossil fuels that would not have happened if solar was already the most affordable form of energy back yeah. then yeah. and in you... reality solar became the cheapest in around 2017 so we mm -hmm. we lost we yeah, lost definitely Interesting and who knows who knows how many more people would have been inspired because you know back then it took a little bit longer for news to travel you know to europe and but eventually it would have and people around the world would have been working on it at the same time. I mean, just to highlight, they were talking about batteries, right? So when I looked mm. at the archival work, they talked about intermittency. They talked about mm. batteries. One of Cove's investors actually turned him down because he's like, oh, well, this will only work if we have strong enough batteries. Can you imagine they had that conversation in 1910? Wow. That sounds like a conversation we could have today. But the it's, fact it's that we stunning. had it you wouldn't even believe I was watching a video the other day on CBC and the, the premier of Alberta was, you know, bashing batteries today when they were having these conversations back then. Like, yeah. can, can you imagine? Um, but let's, so now we're here, right? Like, we don't know if it's the fossil fuel industry. We don't really know, but every indication and every calculation and every scientific research and theory you put forward is turning towards that direction. But, but we're here today and, you know, it's unfortunate, but we'll have to talk about this. And I, I, I like how you, 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 
you concluded your article by giving us the, the idea of you know the Marvel Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, we're talking about alternate universes now, mm -hmm. right? Where if we didn't go this way, where we you know where could have the the trajectory taken us, right? Tell us a little bit about that. You mentioned an alternate century, right? Not universe, but century. Like, how did you see that playing out? So this is obviously a thought experiment, but here's my take at it, okay? And I'm going to be open. This is my opinion. Okay. I think the world would have started battery research far, far earlier. Our batteries would have been far more advanced. Intermittency, that problem, we would have addressed it. Actually, I think we would have a very different paradigm because Climate denial and the wealth that was amassed by the fossil fuel industry resulted in the Koch brothers that have at least spent 200 millions on sowing oh, yeah. disinformation. Yes. Uh, you would have all seen the uh, the killers of the flower moon. Right? I watched we, it. I watched it this past weekend. Right. So I don't think that would have happened. Um, I think we need to be really honest about how behind many great fortunes, there's a very big crime. And yeah. Killers of the Flower Moon actually shows that. I think the uh, whole idea of anti-monopoly regulation is that when any one power becomes so huge yeah. that they control 90% of oil, J.D. Rockefeller mm. in today's terms would be worth 420 billion U.S. dollars, like which, is more, which is more rich than any of the billionaires we have today. So this is adjusted by inflation and as a proportion of GDP. Remember that this person mm. is not democratically elected, yet they have so much power. And this is a problem we still struggle with. The thing about solar is that it's democratic. You don't need to own the oil. You don't need mm. to have an oil field. The sun shines everywhere. Every and that is the great promise of renewables because they're democratic. The, mm -hmm. the fuel source is sunshine and wind. And guess what? Most places have that. Right. Yeah, they have even the oh, most, yeah. Re, yeah, even the most remote communities that in other way, it's it's so hard to get them all the infrastructure that they need. They can still adopt solar. Right. So and I think this idea of a very democratic technology, a technology that could be held by the demos, the people that works against the concentration of wealth that already happened in the fossil fuel paradigm, because oil and coal is not controlled by the demos, right? Let's be real no. about that. No. Um, so I think we would be looking at very different political structures, to be honest. Would we have petro states where citizens give up democracy because of petro dollars? Um, I'm not sure because we would have had a competing freedom. Mm -hmm. There's this joke, freedom. there's this meme online where you like you say you're digging behind your you know your backyard and then all of a sudden something black you know, spread from the ground, all of a sudden you see U.S. Marines coming in, we're mm -hmm. coming to liberate you. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, we're bringing freedom. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know I wasn't free. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Sugandra, like, it's been interesting and uh, we could just talk all day, but uh, we, we, we have to at least start at some point. Um, but this has really been a, an eye-opener for me. Like, I thought I read everything in that article, but I've really learned a lot. And, um, mm, me too. and Sophia, did you have any other things to add? I just thank you very much for joining us. This was really exciting. And now, yeah, I want to do my own digging. I want to learn more about him. Yeah. <laughs> time. Thank you very much for, for being on the show. Thank you, Derek. Thank, thank you. you. So it was a pleasure.